Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Man, Ed, we are looking at like one of the all-time great cartoonists, especially for like black and white crime noir kind of comics with uh, Jose Munoz and Carlos Sampea's Alex Sinner. Uh, before we dive into those, quick shout out to everybody at home. We are cartoonists. These are some of our latest books. Uh, Ed Piscor's Red Room, the Antisocial Network collection, is now available wherever books are sold, uh, bookstores, comic book shops, online, and uh, pick this one up sooner rather than later. We are facing paper shortages in the world, and who knows when the second printings of this thing will be out. So if you see this on your local comic shop, make sure and grab it. Maybe grab two of them. Grab one for your friend who is a horror fan, because this is uh, Outlaw Comics at its finest. And uh, anybody who's into horror is probably going to be interested to take a look at Red Room. This is the perfect format for that. So pick it up now. A lot of great back material, even if you kept up with your single issues. How awesome is this? A behind-the-scenes uh, first draft of the story. This is the stuff I ate up as kids. A director-style commentary, page by page, uh, giving some notes for this. So Fanagraphics, good job on their, on their book collection. And uh, grab that wherever books are sold. You can pick up Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, um, one of my latest books, collecting the adventures of the homeless ninja skateboarder as she uh, battles to survive from dumpster diving to fighting all the local ninjas, saving stray dogs, Eight complete stories in this collection of the Image Comics Street Angel series in full color, as you can see, and also available wherever comics and books are sold. But the name of the game today, Ed, is Sinner and uh, Alex Sinner, two ex-Argentinian cartoonists that meet in Europe. Um, you know, they, they flee Argentina around the time of, like, uh, Osterheld, you know, his, uh, his disappearance, you know, very politically, uh, during a time of political unrest in Argentina's history, but a, uh, a country known for some really good cartoonists coming out of there. We think of Brescia, we've looked at some of his work in the past, um, Eternaut, one of the great comics to come out of Argentina. But uh, these two cartoonists, they move out of Argentina, and they meet in Europe, and they start producing Sinner in the 70s. And... Uh, it's been collected in different places. Probably the first place that it was printed in the U.S. was in Raw Magazine. Yeah. Uh, a couple of these stories appeared in Raw Volume 3 and 6. And then you see Fanagraphics on the cover of Sinner. This is how I found Sinner. Yeah, me um, too. Late 80s into the early 90s. Uh, Kim Thompson Project, I believe. You know, I think he probably did translations for this. But this appealed to me because I started looking at black and white comics and this is some of the best of the black and white comics. So I thought we could just kind of flip through. These are uh, the latest editions that I'm aware of in English from IDW and uh, Dean Mullaney's, you know, working, working overtime at IDW, bringing us some of the all-time great comics. So thanks to him on this one. But we often talk about book design. These are spectacular. This is a kind of a newsprint-like paper that these are printed on. I can't think of a better treatment for this kind of artwork. And Absolutely. I'm just going to kind of flip through and we can we can riff and talk about uh, talk about these comics because, you know, when we talked to Klaus Jansen, he mentioned this is a cartoonist that he keeps near his drawing table. I think I think uh, Munoz had a big impact on a lot of the 80s uh, cartoonists in yeah, America. Yeah, I think so, man. Like, I'm, I'm taking a look at, uh, at issue one uh, from, from the, uh, the Fantagraphics edition, and, and we're looking at Sampeo and... Munoz sitting there with, I don't know, the editor or something like that? No, this that's Sinner. There's a story where they, they're, like, following him around to get, you know, uh, <laughs> story ideas. When you see, uh, there's no reason to bury the lead, man. Uh, when you see these ink lines like that, these confident ink lines, you think Frank Miller. Absolutely. You know, so so this is, a, this is an integral part of the Sin City soup. And first paragraph, man, who's Munoz? He's a student of Hugo Pratt and Alberto Brescia. Yeah, I mean that, and I think he started whenever he was about fourteen. Like he, he yeah. studied under them at a very young Born age. Born in 1942, first published strip 1959. Wow! So, kind of knew uh, knew what what he was doing from the get go. You know, a uh, precocious talent, if you will. Yeah, like it's this kind of stuff, man. You know, like you can't call it a dumb line, but it's definitely this very confident, fast gritty like uh, you can imagine the crow quill catching some paper fiber as uh he's bringing it across the page and pulling some up and he just doesn't care like it doesn't matter spectacular use of like spotting blacks and shadows and also uh and you'll see it as, as we flip is like the care catcher element you know yeah. like so many of these characters are a little bit cartoonished um you know pushing pushing who they are uh sinner 
a perfect noir hero. You know, he he was an ex policeman and he leaves the police because of corruption. He's uh he's like uh, Frank Serpico kind mm -hmm. of kind of character. Man, there's that the thin blue line and all the all the guys are in business for themselves and he's the one kind of hippie. And constantly in a state of uh, not doing well, you know, these characters. This is a New York City that uh, they depicted before they ever traveled to New York City, which I kind of like, you know, like there's there's that kind of a history of uh, New York as this, you know, almost like we know it from movies and stuff, or, or people know it from, you know, movies and media. As, as, as far as this first issue is concerned of the Fantagraphics, they nev they've never been to New York. So it's completely this idea of pop culture. And uh, Sam Payo, like admits that the big city has metaphor like like New York is shorthand for just the urban jungle. Yeah, exactly. And it feels right in that 70s kind of urban depiction, you know, crime is everywhere, threats are everywhere. It's a fallen world that uh that Alex Sinner lives in. And, you know, very inventive in the things that he's depicting, right? Like a stage show is something to draw eye candy. You know, as we're watching these characters moving through crowds, it's very inventive in that regard. And Sempeo, I don't believe, wrote comics before this. You know, I think once he hooks up with Munoz and, you know, they're two ex-Argentinians, uh, they connect, you know, on a personal level and with the works that they enjoy, and the comics come out of that. But I, I don't think Sampeo's background was comics writer. I could believe that, <laughs> because of reading this first issue, it's like, yeah, okay. Look at some of this drawing, like that guy's glasses, the facial expressions. He really pushes that... I feel funny calling it cartoony. You know, that's that's the way I would describe whenever you exaggerate some of these features. But in his hands, it feels like something else. Like Check it feels like out. expressive drawing. Like that's Dwight it, during like big big fat Dude, 100%, kill era. percent, a hundred percent. That drapery, the way that he's communicating, and with just like the thick pulls of black. I remember we did the uh, I think the Tim Truman shoot interview where he's talking about something that Bissett taught him. Uh, you spot your blacks first, meaning just. Yeah. Put black areas down on the paper first and, th and then do your lines. And you feel like maybe he does that, you know, like like maybe this weird mark got inked before any of the lines and stuff. You know, these weird marks, they just get me. It's really a smart way to work. You, you work with your biggest tool first. Drop in the biggest spots, you know, compositionally. Love all the lettering. I feel like the lettering is shorthand for that, um, for an urban setting. Sure. You know, this, the signage and stuff in the background. Big fan of that. How about these screens? Um, you know, we talk often about Chaikin and Miller using screens and things, but this may predate both of theirs. Look at that for a background, man. Central Park. And then there will be a healthy amount. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Miller in the context of the time that he might have discovered this work. Because that I, feels like page layouts right out of some of the Sin City stuff it, Miller's doing. Exactly. And I don't I didn't see any of them in the stuff that we were checking out, but there's a lot of these like captions down the side with like big images, two, three panel pages. Yeah, uh, that really feels like Miller. This like I don't know if the if if these are like they're in here. Are they the same structure in terms of page layout and stuff? I believe that they are. I, I think that that story is a little bit atypical. You know, like if you pull out other Sinner magazines, I think that structure is not, um, well, you know, I can pull one out. Like this one's fun because it has uh, it has our our heroes are the cartoonists. Oh, so yeah. you get to see them on the covers there, you know, working on their story. But you can see it's a tighter, you know, it's a tighter piece. This feels exactly like a Sin City lift, right? Like, how many how many dancers did Miller draw that were complete silhouettes except for a couple of details of clothing that would be uh, would stand out in white? You yeah. know, it's kind of a perfect for, perfect page for that. It's even the centerfold. Like, this would be the page that would open up on Miller's desk, be sitting there on his drawing table. But again, with this kind of abstraction, and um, you know, if you're watching this at home, if you're if you're in awe of these cartoonists, then I encourage that that's the right reaction. Um, you might want to pick these up. I've heard that this is getting very low print run, and uh, I don't know how much, you know, whether that's something that would be reprinted or not. But paper-wise, this reminds me of the Fourth World reprints. Whenever DC had their misprinting of Jack Kirby's Fourth World hardcovers, and it was that beautiful, beautiful painting, or uh, beautiful printing. Um, this is this similar kind of feeling. I don't know if it's actually newsprint. I think it's just an uncoated gray paper stock. But it's perfect for this work because it's so pulpy. Yeah. You know, like you can almost feel like there's something getting on your thumb, you know, as you're turning the pages and look stuff. Look at that, man. This whole page, I mean, you know, look at that for a silhouette face. It's about as far as you can push 
uh, push these cartoon forms and still be readable. But he, he stocks these different locations. Um, you know, one of the other places that his work appeared was Catalan printed a Joe's Bar. And Joe's Bar is where Alec hangs out. You know, it's like his local uh, local watering hole. And again, you can see him doing inventive mark making. It's not just the giant brush. He also has that pen tool that he's coming in and putting some of these details in. This is that slick paper and the lines feel thinner. And I, I just love the way the ink is absorbed on that newsprinty. Yeah. Kind of paper. The one thing with these is the blacks are black. Yeah. This is like, uh, you know, this is a moonless night that you're looking looking at the blacks on these pages. But again, inventive artist, you know, and I can't help but think of a guy like Brescia whenever you see this kind of approach to, uh, you know, abstract this figure a little bit. Sphincter ears. <laughs> Look at that face. I know. <laughs> that's a Dick Tracy, you know, that's, that's coming out of Chester Gold School there. Wow. And I don't know, man, you know, six, 800 pages of this stuff exist in a, in a pretty easy to access format out there. So I don't know what else to say. You know, this guy is a revelation and it's kind of cool that he's been being printed in English. You know, like I said, these stories are from the seventies, but he's been being imported by several different publishers in the States since the early eighties. You know, I think when people come in contact with this, he's a drawer. Yeah. And that's a rare thing in comics. These guys that really just, you can just stare at their drawings. I think David Mazzucchelli when I see some of these things, you know, I mean like... When we see that, when he starts playing with a brush, yeah, yeah, for sure. But when we're in this like gritty, you know, like, let me just go back to some of the old stuff. Um, the, this pen and ink, it, I think of uh, Taiyo Matsumoto. Mm, that's a good call. I never make that connection. Now it's, it's perfect when you say that. I was thinking like Edward uh, Rizzo. Yeah, the, yeah, uh, Edward Bullets. Rizzo, yeah, for sure. You know, it's one of those guys that I think his influence is, is pretty major uh, in comics. You Keith know? Giffen? <laughs> Giffen got in some trouble with this stuff. I was going to pull out. If you want to see, you know, Keith Giffen swiped some panels from this and was called out for it, uh, probably by the Comics Journal and other places. And one of the uh, books you can find that in is his Fate miniseries. Like, Alex Sinner's in Fate. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's totally. not just a compositional lift. That's kind of cool drawing. Uh, it's literally like, you know, panels being being put in there. So very, very, uh, I can't say under the radar, but a very profound influence, I think, on American comics once this starts to enter the market in the 80s. You know, once again, cartoonist, cartoonist kind of thing. Stuff, like dreaming and seeing that, that train bus coming through his mind as he's asleep. They would always use... Uh, Sinner imagery in house ads in in Fanta books and certainly a lot of the earliest Fanta books, Fanta graphics comics that that I got my hands on, and the artwork was so scary and ugly. Like I I had to like grow into like even looking at a Sinner comic because it was just too far removed from what I knew to be comics or something growing up. That's a good point. That scary thing really works whenever you're doing a comic that should feel a little more adult. Because it would be this image, you know, and, and like, you know, that looks... To a little kid who's used to slick kind of imagery and you see that, like, that could be a prison drawing or something. Not only that, it looks like somebody that you might see and probably steer clear of. Yeah, this is totally. not a guy who's got patience for a kid. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is somebody, you, you, you walk a wide berth around this guy. Yeah, he's got the face of a pug. Absolutely, yeah. Not not interested Pugilist. in uh, yeah. Not, not, uh, not interested dog. in in uh, playing nice with the kids or anything like that. But wild, wild drawing. And like I said, IDW Dean Mullaney, like they did it with these. These yeah. are really good presentations of of uh, a, a very influential and specific artist, a stylist. Yeah, yeah. For so sure. really awesome. Some of my favorites from uh, from the import comics of, of the '80s, the black and white stuff of the '80s. Like he he crosses over a lot of these different areas that I'm interested in. I saw your Ides sticker on your center. Yeah. I can't imagine where I got mine. Like they they came from some discount somewhere, you know, a flea market find or something of that along those lines. Which it was like, you know, when I'm about fourteen, fifteen, looking for comics, and you find this. That's quite an image. Yes, that's that's quite a cover, <laughs> you know? Hard to ignore that kind of thing. Let me give shouts to Dean Mullaney for sneaking the Eclipse logo in and the Euro Comics How about piece that? as well, man. I like that. A little, 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 uh, little callback for uh, Mullaney. I thought Mullaney might have printed these original ones at Eclipse and, uh, and you know, realized it was Fanographics, mm -hmm. but... You know, more testament to uh, to Munoz and Sampeo that they are printed by all these different people. Art Spiegelman, you know, does the introduction 
on uh, on Joe's bar. So publish them in, in raw. Maybe, maybe that was the first time that Munoz's work shows up in America probably in raw. You know, and these are these are your big style. Uh, you know, like lighthouses. These are the, the the companies, the influential companies that are bringing. Who are the top cartoonists? Who should you be seeing? And uh, several of them reaching for once they see see Munoz and Sanpeo being like, yeah, let's uh, let's publish some of that stuff here. Yeah, for sure, man. Awesome to look at. Uh, maybe sometime in the future we'll crack open like a full story and, and, yeah. and get in. And deep. it would definitely be worth like doing that. You know, it's it's overwhelming. Like I've, I've been wanting to put this stuff on here forever, and you know, again, eight hundred, a thousand, pages. A thousand pages of this stuff. Where do you begin? Uh, this is just an overview, but doing one story would be a good way to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what makes the these um, memorable comics and comics that have now stood the time, test the time, 50 years. 50 years, these comics. We're getting old, Jimmy. We are. <laughs> they still look new. <laughs> it's good stuff, man. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download a dozen out of print zines and mini comics. You can see a bunch of my original art, layouts, scripts, the process that I make, Street Angel, Plain Janes, Octobriana, and more. That's all at patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room, the antisocial network, trade paperback in stores today. Uh, go to your local comic shop, scoop it up, man. And if you're in a pinch, grab it off Amazon. They are going quickly. Uh, if you see it, grab it because you can't take for granted it's going to be on the shelf the next time you're in the comic shop. And uh, it's going to take a while for those reprints to, to happen. Put in that pre-order for Red Room trigger warnings while you're at it. Uh, it was going to come out in December, but those paper shortages, there, there's some real deal stuff. And that comic has been pushed back six weeks to February. Uh, gives you plenty of time to get that put on your pull list. And I'd like to see them uh, get sold out on, on, on day one. All these links are on my link tree in the description below this video. Jimmy, what else do we have? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. All right, give them those marching orders, man. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.